Marriage has started really with combinations of male and female figures um, and that's why I use the word marriage and I found that the, the, the marriage between male and female was very, I don't know what the word is, um, it made them very very vulnerable you could identify with them. Somehow the original images feel distant you don't feel a connection with that person. You, you sometimes recognize them, you recognize the type or something like that. But the moment you start to combine them in this way, I felt they became more human, more, you could, feel, you could see, you could identify with them in some ways. And so the marriage series emerged out of this idea of them, this identification with a, with a persona that was completely invented. Um, <coughs> but as the series developed, a slightly comic dimension started to emerge, firstly with things like this, and then much more extremely with these. And then when I'd run out completely of head and shoulders, totally, I, there were no more that I could use. I, my stock had run out, and I'd been left with a large quantity of um, three-quarter views, which I didn't think I could use. And the reason I didn't think I could use them was because they seemed comic. They seemed to be parodied in a way. And I, so I called this series, as it emerged into the three, three-quarter view, um, Betrayals. And the, the reason that I called them, I, I thought, well, betrayal comes after marriage, um, in a very cynical way. <laughs> and, but also, um, transsexuals are said to be betrayed by their hands. And this is where hand gesture comes into it. It's, um, it's a strange image, yes. And there is a comic dimension, but I think it's also quite tragic, too. There is a pathos, I think, in all of them. In fact, I think that's what conjoins the whole set, is that there is a strange pathos about them all. For a while, they all became very thin, you know, like Giacometti or something. At other times, it was all to do with the hand. Each, sometimes it's to do with aligning the, uh, the, the mouth, the teeth, sometimes with the eye. They're all different, different phases. In, I mean, I've been working on these for a long time, so there are many different phases to the, to the series. I like that idea of, somehow because of the idea, again, of the mask, in a way, that, the, that somehow taking, by thinning the head, you remove the idea of the substantiality of the person and it becomes just about the image, really. The image liberated from that, that persona. But it's gone through all sorts of phases. I mean, I've even gone through a phase where I've made them very fat, and the opposite, so they become big and gross. But there are none on show here. But some of the classic examples of tra the, the traumatic images are images of the concentration camps in the Second World War, the various ones, and there's always the one of the chien en denue cutting of the eye. And it, I was reading this student's dissertation and I thought, oh, the next one's going to be chien en denue, and I turned, I can't even look at the picture, you know, it, it disturbs me. I thought, ah, oh, isn't that strange? I can't look at it. I didn't ever consider myself in this. And I thought, yes, of course. That's why I'm always cutting things near eyes, because of the chien en denue. It really freaked me out when I first saw that film. I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't even know it was going to happen. Um, it, uh, and it was probably the most shocking image I've ever seen. So I decided I would try to do a chien and a new cut, exactly. So I blinded the man, and I called it blind. In fact, I did several, but only that one worked. And then the others that didn't work, I found some in which I had doubles. So I didn't know whether you want to move around. Yeah. And this was the first. So I had these other blinds which weren't working. Yeah. I don't know why they didn't work, but they didn't work. But it happened that I had two of them. And I just happened to put it like this. And it created this image of love to me, you know, like attraction, sexual attraction. It was a bit of a joke at first, and, but sort of disturbing joke in a way. Um, and I feel that in a way, all of my work is this dialogue between the violence of the cut and a, a reparative dimension, a dimension of healing, you might say. I like to think the work is healing. 
just like in the, in the portraits we were looking at before, the marriage series, I like to think that, those, that there is something you can, you can feel an empathy for in those people, and that empathy, which is denied in the ordinary encounter with portraits, is a kind of healing process. It's a way of bridging subjectivities, myself, people who look at my work, or whatever, or between people in general. Yeah. I used to, when I, was, when I hadn't got very much money, I used to think, I used to worry about cutting a picture because it, if I paid five pounds for it, and you know, my, my weekly income was 30 pounds, say, that was a lot of money. Um, and I was very, very, well, I always used to do Xeroxes and various things before I made the actual cut. But gradually with time, I began to realize that there's nothing lost. If I cut an image, it'll go and it doesn't work. It goes into a box of bits of image, and all those bits are really valuable. And so even dismantling work, I tend to produce a lot of work, and then gradually the pieces lose interest for me until I'm left with maybe one or two. Maybe one. That's what this show is, is all the ones that are left that still haunt me in some way. In the 1920s or 30s, there were two sets of encyclopedia, one called Countries of the World, the other called Peoples of the World. And it was, in the pre-war period, it was a way in which you could subscribe to a magazine and you'd get it in bits and then you'd put it all together into these encyclopedia. And eventually you would have a, a set of encyclopedia representing world geography. But everywhere at that time, well, there were always these images that were taken from above, looking down on cities with lots of people um, in them. And Gradually, I started to isolate these completely tiny figures that were often not even noticed by the photographer. And I was really interested in the, the phenomenon of these because it, it, it seemed the further away they got, the more empathy I felt with the, with the figures. The less you knew about the figures, the more tiny they became, the more you could feel a sense of human empathy. And I found that strange. Why should you feel that? Why, should, why don't I feel a stronger empathy for somebody I can see fully and know everything about? You know, I know what class they belong to, what sex, etc. But the further away you get, there seemed to be a point at which you could, it was more like an empathy with humanity itself, with our own separateness, our own mortality. And that's what this series did for me, really. There are different categories within it. Um, you know, sometimes I take a little part of the foreground of a, an image and, a, and make it look like there's some kind of narrative going on, somebody stalking somebody else or somebody, somebody encountering somebody else. This is a little group here of people turning to the, towards seeing the camera. Um, so they all have different little ideas behind them, but in the end, the universal thing is this relationship with the other and with separation and with distance, I think. Yeah, this is kind of, um, in, in, um, interestingly, in the Whitechapel, there were only two of these, just like there were only two nudes. Uh, there are many series that we haven't been able to represent very well. For example, the nudes over here, there's many, many of those. And there's many of the lost tracks using the, the, these, and there's lots of the Underworld series of that. But this one was slightly more comprehensive, um, and it's called The Bridge. Um, there's a very famous short story by Franz Kafka called The Bridge, which was very influential. If you ever read the story of The Bridge by Franz Kafka, it corresponds almost exactly to a dream I had, um, which was very powerful, in which I was both going over a bridge and under a bridge. I was the bridge. Difficult to explain. But the actual series began with me collecting images of places that might have been a prototype for Franz Kafka's The Castle. I became obsessed by his The Castle. It's a book I've never finished, actually. I've read it several times, but I always seem to never get to the end. It's not important. You know it's going to go on forever. There's no ending, really. Um, and I started becoming interested in Prague Castle and the various other castles that, that, that were the prototype for, for, for The Castle. So the, the series began with the title The Castle. But gradually, the most dominant motif was this intercutting between the top parts, the skies, of two photographs. If you see what I mean. So, for example, 
sky, 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 sky. So that the intermediate space became a kind of bridge. And I thought of it as a sort of bridge between the world of life and death, all kinds of different metaphors for this. And it somehow resonated with this dream I had. And um, it was only later I discovered a short story by Kafka called The Bridge. And then I realized that that's what it was about, actually. But the, sh the, the focus of this show is very much on film and human beings, really, um, which I suppose is the center of my work.